So what I want to talk to you guys about is um, the uh, maybe some of the less positive. Uh, that's just, that's just um, some of the less positive aspects of that. Like, um, and and where this comes from is research I've been doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the things that goes on in these places is as the wars have been going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, the ICT penetration has gone way up. Right. So this is kind of an estimate of the proportion of the population of Iraq. It's you know, a country of about uh, uh, 20 some, uh, 22, 23 million people. Uh, this is an estimate of the proportion of the population covered by the network of this company, Zane, which was the monopoly provider in the parts of the country that experienced most of the war uh, from 2003 through 2008. And so, you know, as you can see, Zane's, Zane's kind of coverage is growing dramatically throughout the war. Um, you know, I can show you some pictures of this. What these are is this is just a map of Iraq, the kind of, um, do you guys have a pointer? Yeah, I have a pointer. Okay. Yes. I see, like, so in this case it's cell phone coverage. So each dot here represents a, a, um, a tower that typically has kind of three antenna on it. Um, I should set this up to do the slides too if you want. No, that's okay, just the pointer would be great. Okay. Cool. So, um, so just to highlight for those of you guys who aren't familiar with Iraq's geography, um, you know, you've got, uh, you've got Baghdad right here, you've got Basra down here. And basically what, what these are showing you is in the year of 2004, the black dots are the towers that were active at the start of that year. The red dots are the towers that were built during that year. And the gray dots are all the towers that will eventually be built. And down here, this is just the number of towers added per month. And so what you can see is as the war is going on, um, the cellular network is being built out, and they build out in kind of a ses sensible way. Right? You start with kind of putting in cell phone coverage uh, around the main population centers, and then you start to build on the main transport routes down to the south and out to the um, uh, out to the out to the west to Syria, and then you know you start to kind of build the network in in 2005, fill it in. Um, you know you continue to build things in 2006, and you notice at like the height of the war from mid-2006 to mid-2007, when the violence got really, really bad, um, basically construction activity uh, slows down a great deal and then picks right back up as violence starts to come down uh, in the main parts of the country. And, you know, they continue to, to build out, flesh out the network in 2008 and 2009. Some of this is um, improving coverage. Have you guys talked about how cell phone networks work yet? Okay, yeah, so some of this is like cell splitting and building out the network so it can cover more calls at higher quality as, as demand and usage goes up. And some of this is covering new areas, um, you know, where they want to they provide coverage along these highways so that people have continuous use and, and they can bill more and whatnot. Um, what's interesting about this is if we normally think about like cell phones as kind of an unalloyed good, but if you think about the problem of producing violence, Right, so organizing an ambush, building bombs, um, getting people together to kill your enemies. Uh, for all of these things, efficient communications are really important. Right? So the most obvious one is, if I want to get a bunch of guys with guns together at a particular point in time to kill you, um, I need to be able to call you, you, and you, three of you guys, and say, all right, we know that he's going to be traveling down this road at this time, so you position yourself here, you put yourself here in a blocking position, we'll be here and here, you stop him with some, some fire, we'll get him in a crossfire, he's done and we've accomplished our mission. Doing that is much easier if you can, you know, call each other or text each other in the same way that it's easier to get together with a bunch of friends for a movie, right? So kind of coordination is easier. Um, you can also think that it's easier to put out people who are kind of spotters or will tell you when your target's coming. Um, you can also do things like this. So this is a, this is a weapons cache from Iraq. Uh, so these are some old uh, landmines, these are rocket propelled grenades, um, uh, this is a different kind of um, uh, bazooka type device, and this is a 155 millimeter artillery shell. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of these things were scattered around Iraq uh, after the end of the war because we didn't secure any of the armories during the drive into Baghdad, and what the insurgents have done here is they've attached a cell phone to it as a detonator. And so, you know, you could use cell phones like this in a few ways. You could use them as a timer, so you actually set the alarm on the cell phone and then solder uh, to the circuit, to the speaker, a wire that you would then connect to a blasting cap inside the 155 millimeter artillery shell to set it off. Um, 
So that didn't require cell phone coverage, but you could also use them in other ways. You could use them so that they would be command detonated. Right? So you would place a call to the phone. So you see a coalition vehicle driving by. When it gets to the right spot, you call the phone. The ringtone sends an electronic signal and blows it up. So that was very useful um, for the insurgents. They quickly, though, the, the, the coalition forces quickly figured out that this was going on, so they started jamming. So then these guys started setting, uh, setting these with things where you would prime the circuit and then call it, and it would be set to explode when the call was terminated. Right? And so when the jammer got to the point where it shut off the cell phone signal to the phone, then the bomb went boom. Uh, the problem with this, of course, was you had to like, figure out the range of the jammer. Right? As this vehicle is driving down the road, at what point does it stop the signal? And then you had to kind of set the triggering device sufficiently far ahead of the vehicle, sufficiently far offset from the explosive itself, that as the vehicle is driving down the road, gets to this point, the range is out here, cuts off the signal to the phone here, that then sends the signal back to the bomb here to trigger. So you then got into these very uh, kind of morbid arms races where the, guy, the coalition guys would then put poles on the fronts of their vehicles of varying lengths to put the jammer out at different lengths from the front of the vehicle to mess up this process. Right? Or they would start doing things like flying drones over the highway ahead of a convoy that would systematically kind of shut down the cell phone network and the IEDs would go off as the drone went down and then they could drive down it. So there's, the point is kind of the introduction of this communication technology which normally we think of as being really good because it helps people do things like get fair prices for their produce right, or talk to their friends or coordinate businesses also has this malign uh, side to it. Um, and so, you know, you might think that introducing cell phones and kind of and better communications technology has this bad effect. You know, you also saw during this time lots of, lots of discussions of how the Internet was a useful tool for radicalization and how people could take advantage of websites and the ability to post videos of them, you know, engaging in what they consider to be heroic acts and kind of victorious uh, attacks against the crusader enemy. There was lots of discussion about how that was making it easier to motivate the insurgency. Right? So from all those perspectives, you might think this was a bad thing. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, you might think that, look, for the insurgents in Iraq, um, and to a lesser extent in Afghanistan, if the people you were fighting knew your geotemporal coordinates, so they knew where you were going to be when, they had basically an unlimited ability to put very fast moving pieces of metal into your body. Right? They had vehicles flying overhead that could drop bombs on any point in time and space at any time of day or night. Right? They had kind of massive numbers of helicopters and highly trained individuals who could go into pretty much any place any time they wanted to and shoot you in the head. And so being kind of your critical vulnerability was your ability to operate without being known to the people you were fighting. Right? So this is not like rural African insurgency. This is something very different. And so in that sense, cell phone communications um, uh, create a problem for you. And they do it in two ways. One is, if your guys are talking on their phones, right, one thing that the, that the counterinsurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan were very good at is picking up signals intelligence. Right? So if you have people out there who are doing what any person with a cell phone does, which is you want to talk to your friends and make it easier to coordinate your activities, be they kind of good or bad, that creates a huge vulnerability. Uh, but the other is for the people who aren't, in the, aren't kind of fighting uh, the, the, the coalition in the case of Iraq, you make it a lot safer for them to react to things like this. Um, so this is a tip card that you could read if your TAs had their resolution properly set. Um, but basically, so this is one from uh, 2010 uh, in Baghdad, but basically throughout the war, um, coalition forces were distributing things like this. And, um, you know, since it's kind of hard to read, what this one basically says is, you know, have you seen someone doing something bad um, uh, and you want to do something about it, but you don't want to pick up a gun? Well, just call us and tell us who they are and we'll deal with them. Right? And so in, if, if, if this is going on, then the introduction of, of kind of cellular communications can have a really big effect on the insurgency in a couple of ways. One is it's a lot safer to text this in than to call it because no one can overhear you texting. Moreover, landline penetration in Iraq was really low. And it's a lot safer to pick up the phone and call in some information than it is to actually meet with someone 
uh, from the, the coalition or the Iraqi police. And in fact, kind of the way informants had to be handled to prevent them being identified as informants is you would, the coalition forces or the Iraqi forces would go to like an apartment block, pull out all the men, choose 5, 10% to kind of take them one by one through an interrogation, choose 5, 10% to beat up, including their informant, and then send them back. And that way they, it wasn't clear who the informant was. And this is something that the British did in Malaya. Okay, it's a very common thing. Um, that was what you had to do for your informant to survive, because otherwise he would be identified as an informant. If he can call in that information, you no longer need to go through that process. And so it's a lot easier to get information. And so all of that leads to the prediction that introducing this technology might need, lead to lower levels of violence. Right? Now, since in lots of places in the world where there's kind of high levels of political violence, the ICT infrastructure isn't great. And since it's really easy to put this stuff in, you might want to know which way this thing, this thing runs. Um, and, you know, so we did some analysis. So what this is, uh, is this is just another plot to show you data because you're engineers. How many of you guys are engineers, by the way? Everyone? Almost? Is it everyone? No, a couple of non-engineers? Okay. I'm with the non-engineers. Um, so, uh, so what this is, is this is just the monthly attacks against uh, coalition and Iraqi forces uh, from uh, February 2004 through February 2009. And each of these plots is a different district of Iraq. So district of Iraq is about 200,000 people in most of the country, about 900,000 people for places like Al-Muqtadiyah, which is an area in central Baghdad. And in blue, I've just plotted the number of insurgent attacks per month. And you can see there's loads of variation across the country, both in kind of the timing of the peaks. Right here in heat, uh, it happens at a very different time uh, than here in Mahmoudiyah. So heat is an area uh, in Anbar governor, it mostly Sunni, Mahmoudiyah is in mixed area in, in Baghdad. Um, and then uh, on, in red is the number of new towers built in that district in that month. Right? So you can see that like in Kark, so this is central Baghdad, mostly the green zone, you know, they build a ton of towers there early on because it's like the wealthiest, most densely populated part of the country, so they need to provide a lot of service. Um, but even when the violence is really bad in the area, they're still adding more coverage. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we do with this is we take this and we do some statistical analysis um, where we basically study the relationship between changes in the number of towers in an area and changes in the rate of insurgent attacks, right, to try and get at, is this technology in this context like a force for good or a force for, for evil? Uh, and it turns out in this context that it's a force for good. So, uh, so basically, increasing the density of coverage within these large districts uh, kind of increasing the number of towers by one standard deviation decreases the attacks by about 10%. So it's 1.1 fewer attacks in the next week. So now just to, just to kind of benchmark this, uh, a tower costs between $50,000 and $200,000 to set up, depending whether you're setting it up on an apartment building or building it on a greenfield site where you need to build the tower. Uh, so you think about the cost of one attack, well if no one gets killed it's pretty low. But if one person gets hurt, that's, you know, millions of dollars in legacy healthcare costs for the VA. If a vehicle gets destroyed, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace. If someone gets killed, right, you have kind of however you want to value life. Most insurance companies do it at about $4 million for kind of a working age uh, person with a family. And so, uh, so, so there's kind of a big, uh, big decrease. Um, and it's a little bit bigger in the places that were most violent, the Sunni and mixed areas. Um, the other thing, though, that we did, which is kind of neat, is we looked at specific local coverage areas, and we compared what happens when you turn coverage on in an area where you introduce new coverage versus one there w where there was already coverage, and what you're doing is just making the network denser. And so these areas are about four kilometers in radius uh, in urban areas, about 12 kilometers in rural areas, and when you turn tower on, towers on, you get about one less attack per 15-day period in these little catchment areas for the ones that introduce new coverage relative to the ones that don't. So you're, you're kind of driving down violence, so that's nice. Um, so that's the story in Iraq. So anyone want to guess what this is? You guys are engineers, man, come on. Huh? 
locations of ambushes? Yeah, exactly. This is the decibel level on the GSM network of the largest telco in Afghanistan around Kabul. Right, so this is Kabul, and each of these little dots is a tower, and you can actually kind of, you can see, the resolution's not great here, but you can actually see the three antenna going out from the tower, which covers about 120 degrees. And the cutoff here is the negative, I think, it's, I think we did this one at the negative 110 dB level, which is about the, the lowest you could possibly get a call through on the Afghan network. And so this is Kabul, uh, and this is the road up to Bagram Air Base. Right? And so, um, so what's interesting about Afghanistan is it's a topographically complex area. So you know, the reason, for example, that these towers don't provide any, this tower here doesn't provide any coverage here, there's a big mountain in the way. Right? And so this thing is set up uh, in the hills to provide coverage for some population centers. Um, you know, this is kind of an overall picture of what, uh, what the coverage in Afghanistan looks like. So the blue areas are covered areas from this largest telco. And the little dots here are estimates of the population for each one kilometer cell, actually, each 30 arc second cell from the land scan, which, uh, which is this project that does population estimates. And what's interesting about this is, is just to highlight two things, is this is a really f sparsely populated country. Um, these guys cover between 60 and 80 percent of the population of the country, depending on which estimate you use. And like, <laughs> there's not a lot of blue on the map. Um, the other thing, though, that's interesting about this is that if you zoom in on some areas, uh, so this is Kandahar, this is kind of the heartland uh, of the Taliban. Uh, Kandahar Airfield is here. This is the kind of second largest logistics base in the country. Um, this is Lashkar Gah, kind of the center of opium production in the world. Um, you see that the cell phone guys, they're covering the main roads reasonably well. Right? This, is the, this is the main road around Afghanistan. Uh, but there are all these populated areas along river valleys where they're not providing any coverage. And so you might, you know, you might wonder why that, why that is. Um, and, you know, just to, to give you some background on this, part of it is there were like 200 people with phone service in Afghanistan when the U.S. and NATO invaded in, uh, in November 2001, roughly 65% of the population now has a cell phone. Right? So the country went from kind of a 16th century level of communication with the outside world to better than most places uh, in Africa in, in, in 10 years. It's kind of, kind of remarkable. So some of this is just it takes a while to build the stuff out. Um, you know, and this is kind of what it looks like. This is just the number of towers active uh, in the 40 most violent districts of Afghanistan. And in the big cities like Herat or Kunduz or Mazari Sharif, you know, they're, they're building more towers. That's not surprising. Um, what is surprising, though, I'll show you this before I show you the last one. Or I don't know if this is surprising. Is something's happening in Iraq that never happened in, in Afghanistan, that never happened in Iraq. So in Iraq, the insurgents would threaten the telecommunications providers if they didn't keep their towers up. All right, so there are lots of r reports from the guys who maintain the network saying, uh, we're, you know, we have this problem, which is whenever a, a tower goes down, say, because we let the generator run out of fuel, we get a call from someone threatening our lives because they really like having the towers up. Right? The opposite is true in Afghanistan. So each of these dots represents a tower. Um, and the ones in black, these are all the towers that this firm has shut down because someone from the Taliban has come to them and said, you need to turn this tower off. Um, the ones that are in yellow that show up here as uh, impacted, you know, so these guys uh, down here around Jalalabad, these are ones where someone from the insurgents has come to them and said, uh, this tower will be off between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. or we'll blow it up. Right? And so they're only providing service for part of the day. Now, why would the insurgents do that? People kind of in Afghanistan clearly love their cell phones because they've all been buying them as fast as they can. Um, well, if you think that people are using this to call in information on you, then you might not want them to be able to talk at night when you're moving around. And so what that, what that means, though, is that for us to do the kind of estimation that we did in Iraq, in Afghanistan, is not possible. Because whether or not you have coverage is a function of 
a bunch of stuff having to do with the market incentives of the cell phone company, but also whether the insurgents are active in an area and want people to be able to use their cell phones. All right, so you can't actually do the estimation the way you did uh, in the other case. That said, um, we did do some, some, we looked at some interesting stuff. So what this is showing you is it's just kind of the correlation, bivariate monthly correlation between revenue at a tower and the number of attacks. And each dot here is a district of Afghanistan. So like Kunduz here, right? In Kunduz, when the number of attacks in a given month goes up by one, on average, revenues in thousands of dollars from the towers in Kunduz go down by about $500. Right? So, but you know, it's kind of all over the map, so there's no clear relationship there. Um, and, you know, so that's really all I wanted to talk about is just, just to highlight the fact that the communications technologies that you guys are studying here are mostly in kind of well-ordered, well-mannered, nicely developed Western countries viewed as an unalloyed good, right? And there's a huge literature that says even in developing countries, they're great, right? There are these papers that show that when you introduce cell phone coverage along the coast of India, all of a sudden the market prices for fish across different markets along the coast converge to one price. Because what happens is the fishermen out doing the fishing, as soon as they haul in their catch, they get on their phone, they figure out where they can get the best price, and they go there. Right? And so the introduction of cell phones there basically disintermediates the market. It takes out the profits that all the middlemen in the markets were making and gives it to the fishermen. Right? So people look at that and they're like, great, markets are more efficient. Right? Same thing happens in grain markets in Niger. Uh, and so we generally look at this technology as an unalloyed good, uh, but in these contexts where there's political contestation, it's not at all clear that that's the case. And this is why in places like Kenya, uh, Egypt, Thailand, when there's kind of protest and violent activity or people are acting politically in ways that are threatening to the regime, one of the first things that happens is there are efforts made to restrict communication and restrict the ability of people to talk to each other and coordinate. So it's kind of a more... In some sense, if you're interested in places that are not yet kind of decisively organized in the ways that the United States or most Western European countries are, all the technologies you're talking about have lots more, lots of kind of more interesting, complicated uh, implications.